coming up next is our speaker. I think, Dan, you're probably best qualified to introduce Joshua Nelson since uh, you've known him as a past pr uh, president of the WASP and the Next Generation. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, uh, Josh was, uh, he, he predates me. <laughs> he was uh, president of uh, the Next Generation um, a few years before I ever showed up. But, uh, you know, I have been lucky enough to book most of our speakers over the last decade or so. I've been around for 12, 13 years. And, you know, I've had the pleasure to invite Westport's David Pogue. He had just finished a uh, Nova series on PBS at the time. Columbia's uh, Shirsten Perez, who worked on the New Star X-ray satellite. And if you remember, her professor was the PI of that space telescope. He was uh, Dr. Chuck Haley. And also, don't forget about the visits we had from the incredible Dr. Stella Kafka. She's the director of the AAVSO, and I would love to have her back again soon. You know, and some of these talks are now available on our YouTube channel. But this month, it's great to have one of our own WAS family take us through some of his experiences working on various space-themed gigs throughout his life since leaving Connecticut. And uh, Josh's father, Todd, who many of us all know, he moved his Plague of Locust crew, I mean his hungry family, <laughs> up to New Hampshire some time ago. But the uh, Nelsons have kept up their membership and the close ties with many of us and are always regulars at star parties like Stella Fane and, and occasionally at CSP as well. However, having just moved to Houston from Arizona in a pandemic while starting a new job as an ISS flight controller is obviously going to be a big challenge. So I'm kind of wondering if you can actually drive the ISS from your house, and Josh may have to. Well, I'm pleased to introduce the former president of WASP TNG, who recently finished up working on our topic tonight, Osiris Rex, now orbiting the asteroid Bennu that is scheduled to return a sample of the asteroid on October 20th. So please welcome back our friend, Joshua Nelson. Thank you very much, Dan, much appreciated. Can you guys hear me? Oh. Yeah. yeah. Cool, just making sure. Never want to start out talking, um, get a few slides in until you realize that no one can hear you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back um, at um, WAS, even if it is virtually talking to you all. Um, in preparation for this talk, I did look up um, and dig through my old files to try to figure out the last talk I gave was at WAS was to WAS TNG sometime in the summer of 2008. I gave a presentation on the uh, status update of Mars Phoenix Lander uh, to WAS TNG. So it's been quite a while since I've given a talk for WAS, but it's really great to uh, hear what's going on in the club these days. Uh, my family again been members since about 1995, where my mom told when my mom told my dad that you will find some way to um, relate to your son. And so we both ended up joining Waz, and I think he's uh, just as, as addicted to amateur astronomy these days as I am. So I, I think that was a wise decision, and it worked out well for both of us. Since leaving Waz, um, I, as some of you who knew me back then uh, knew, I initially went to the University of Arizona um, pursuing a degree in astronomy. So um, with my passion for Waz, going to Connecticut Star Party, Stelfin, and all that, I was really into, um, you know, I just really wanted to be a professional astronomer and do this full time. Um, but needless to say, it turns out that um, professional astronomy is not quite as much looking through telescopes, and it's a lot more staring at data screens. And um, one of the most disheartening um, memories of my entire time as an astrophysicist was when a professor came into the room and basically told us that um, going to the telescope, that's not what a professional astronomer does. That's what the grad student or the engineer does. A professional astronomer sits at home and processes his data. And all the kids in the class are just like, what? Well, how do we become the engineer running the telescope? That's the cool part. So um, I did switch into aerospace engineering, um, and I've been much happier for it personally. But um, I did still go on and get in a, a minors in astronomy, physics, and planetary science. And actually, at the time when I was working in the university, I was the head telescope operator for um, Stewart Observatory for a number of years there, um, working the 21-inch there on campus. And I also had time to work at some of the telescopes up in the big mountains. From there, I went and got my um, certificate from the International Space University at the Space Studies Program, and then my Master of Science um, in Space Studies at the University of North Dakota, where I did um, some thesis work on plant growth and Mars greenhouses. A little quick recap on my um, professional experiences. Um, I worked at NASA Ames for a little while on a cool project called the Moon Mars Underground Mole or MUM. This is a, penetra a penetrator that um, they were preparing. Um, they're trying to increase the TRL level on this technology before bringing it to Mars. Uh, essentially, it was a US 
version of a penetrator that was made for the Beagle lander, if you guys remember, uh, which had a um, mishap trying to land on Mars. But it's a drill that um, very, very slowly pounds itself into the ground on Mars. It has to go very slowly because you don't want the heat of the drill entering the Martian regolith to um, evaporate any of the volatiles um, and gases that might have lower melting temperatures or evaporation temperatures. And so that's why you go very, very slowly through the Martian surface, taking um, spectra as you go down. From there, I went on to the International Space University in Strasbourg, France, where I worked for um, about four years on the self-deployable habitat for extreme environments, which you can see in the lower right-hand corner there. It's a deployable Mars analog habitat um, that we moved around from place to place into different uh, Mars analogs um, after building it and did things like um, various astronaut tests, spacesuit tests, rover tests, habitability studies, and it's uh, still being used to this day. And then the main reason I'm here to give the talk today is for, uh, I spent the last three years um, in the University of Arizona working on the NASA OSIRIS-REx um, mission as a science operations engineer. So essentially, um, whenever a scientists uh, decided that they want to take a photo of that rock, um, I would take the science plan and then turn it into the commands that would then be radiated to the spacecraft, um, telling the spacecraft how to take a photo of that rock. Of course, running all the various tests and um, checks on those commands before they went to the spacecraft, and then um, checking everything that came back from the spacecraft to make sure those commands got executed properly. And then only recently, since the mission uh, OSIRIS-REx is wrapping up slowly here, um, they are down ramping the science staff. I recently changed jobs and moved from Tucson all the way out here to cloudy, cloudy Houston, Texas. I've not seen Comet Neowise yet because you look at the um, weather chart for Houston, we've had nonstop clouds and thunderstorms for about the last two weeks. Uh, whereas Tucson's been nice and uh, sunny. But um, yes, yeah, so I've taken a job here in Houston as a flight controller for the International Space Station, and I'll be working a lot with the visit visiting vehicle program, working with things like the Dragon, the Progress, HTV, and the other um, visiting spacecraft to the space station. But more importantly for today, OSIRIS-REx. So um, what does OSIRIS-REx stand for? Like everything in NASA and the space industry, we can't resist turning something into an acronym. Um, and everyone uh, jokes here that your mission um, increases its TRL level, its technology readiness level. I can't even resist using an acronym right then and there. Um, by one, just by coming up with a fancy acronym for your mission. So the OSIRIS-REx mission stands for Origins, Spectral Interpretation, Resource Identification, Security, Regolith Explorer. And so all these different words um, outline different aspects of the goals of our mission. So first of all, origins. We are looking for origins of life here on Earth. Asteroids um, contain lots of interesting chemicals, um, lots of carbon-rich uh, elements that might have one day, that might have um, seeded Earth with the building blocks for life in the past. And so we want to go to these asteroids and study their compositions, see what their water content is, see um, what various carbon-based um, molecules are on the surfaces of these asteroids to re better refine our models on how life um, evolved here on Earth and what um, methods Earth got on um, all the water and on um, building blocks for life that it had um, in those early days. Spectral interpretation. So we are taking a whole bunch of different spectra of the asteroid and really spectrometers are our main ways of identifying what um, the composition of this asteroid is. Uh, we are going to, of course, get our sample later on, but in order to pick which are the most interesting sites for science and to really characterize this asteroid as best we can, we have a whole suite of spectrometers um, that we are in detail mapping this asteroid to a level that no one has ever mapped in um, a planetary body like this before. Um, resource identification. So everyone loves talking about um, in situ resource utilization and space mining and asteroid mining. Well, we want to identify what resources are potentially on this asteroid that could later be exploited by future missions, either robotic missions um, utilizing resources for ISRU or maybe one day uh, human missions. Also security. So the asteroid Bennu, which we are going to, is a potentially hazardous object. And there are lots of things about asteroids orbits and how they change over time that we do not um, fully understand. And so by exploring the asteroid Bennu to a level of detail that no one has explored an asteroid before, we hope to um, narrow down some of these parameters, things I'll talk about a little bit later in this talk, but like the Yarkovsky effect or the Yorp effect, which we know 
happen and they affect the orbits of asteroids, but we really need to um, pin down detailed numbers, um, precise numbers for these effects in order to understand the threat that various asteroids pose to the Earth. And last but not least, Regolith Explorer. So we are going to grab a piece of this asteroid, a big scoop of regolith, and bring it back here to the Earth for a detailed study. So that's a whole bunch, but there, um, so believe it or not, when we say Osiris Rex, there is actually a method to the madness and all the different um, letters that make up that acronym. So first of all, why did we um, select the asteroid Bennu? There are so many asteroids out there. Um, we went through a really detailed selection process to um, choose why we actually are going to Bennu. Um, we started out with our list of um, asteroids. We had about um, 500,000 asteroids that we considered. Of those, about 7,000 of those were um, considered near-Earth asteroids that um, intersect the orbit of the Earth. It might be um, potentially hazardous um, one day, which, was, as I mentioned, is one of the things we want to um, study. Of those, about 192 asteroids had an orbit that was optimal for sample return. So we knew we wanted to bring a piece of this asteroid back to Earth for further analysis. So that further constrained us. We also wanted asteroids with a diameter of greater than 200 meters. Um, this was important because we were going to specifically look for um, fine-grained regolith. We wanted um, sample sizes of things two centimeters in size or less. Um, we can't just go and grab a giant boulder um, with a net and bring it back to Earth. Um, despite some early mission proposals in the last 10 years to do exactly that, um, we use a capture device that collects lots of fine-grained particles. And so in order to do that, we need an asteroid that is big enough that it has the gr enough gravity to attract um, and accumulate these fine-grained particles on its surface. We also wanted to specifically study um, carbon-rich asteroids. And so there were five carbon-rich asteroids of those 26 um, asteroids that were identified with a proper diameter. Um, because we want to, again, be looking at the building blocks for life. We want to look for water and um, asteroids with potential aqueous history, um, asteroids that at one point in time might have had um, interactions with water in the past to make some of these uh, interesting uh, elements and minerals that uh, might have been building blocks for life. And for that, we needed carbon-based um, asteroids, uh, carbon-rich asteroids, sorry. And then finally, of these five, we wanted um, to compare what we knew before going in and what we um, found out after and really see from all of our ground studies of asteroids, like the occultation studies you guys have been doing at WAS, which is actually really exciting to hear some WAS members are doing um, say amateur science like that. That's really exciting to hear. I'm really uh, glad to hear you guys working on that. Um, also things like Arecibo. Um, so many people have used um, a number of radar um, in the past to, as asteroids pass relatively close to Earth to get detailed um, radar pictures of the asteroids and um, very detailed astronomical studies of the asteroids. And so we picked of those five carbon rich asteroids, the asteroid that we had the most data going in. Um, so then we know one, that this is an asteroid that we really want to study and there's a lot of um, interesting potential um, for advancing the knowledge of humankind. And then also that um, we can then compare what we knew ahead of time with what we discover when we get to Bennu and see how accurate are these ground-based observations of asteroids. Bennu um, is about 500 meters in uh, diameter. So we, that puts it at just over the size of the Empire State Building. And a little bit about what we actually knew from Earth. So as I mentioned, um, Bennu is perhaps the most um, well-characterized asteroid from the ground before um, vis being visited by a spacecraft. We had a detailed um, model, as you can see there um, on the right, the left-hand screen there is the actual um, data from the Arecibo um, telescope. They um, reflected radar off um, the off Bennu and developed this um, radar model. And then on the right-hand side, that is the full 3D uh, model they worked up for the asteroid before we went there. Um, we knew approximately its diameter. We knew it was about 493 meters in diameter. Turned out to be actually be a little bit bigger than that when we got there. 4.3 hour rotational period. It has about 436 day um, year. Its orbit around the sun is about 436 in days in, uh, in length. Uh, also um, potentially has um, lots of carbon and volatiles from our spectral studies. And we had about a decent idea of what we were expecting um, density-wise and potentially the uh, composition of the asteroid itself. Um, so everyone always wants to know where is Bennu? Bennu orbits in um, an orbit that goes 
doesn't quite reach the orbit of Mars, but it um, hangs out, mo spends most of its time between the orbits of Earth and Mars. But as you can see by this chart, it does actually intersect Earth's orbit at two different um, points in its orbit. So it is um, considered a potentially hazardous object. Fortunately, so far, um, both Venu and Earth have never been in the same point at, uh, in space at the same, same time but there is the potential for um, that in the future. So we wanted to narrow down um, the parameters um, of Venus orbit and how it changes over time to see if one day it might intersect um, with the Earth. So let's talk a little bit about spacecraft, my, my baby. Now, as you can see, um, spacecraft, um, we kind of nicknamed it in, the, in this configuration right here. Um, this is the Karate Kid. Um, configuration. So it has um, its solar arrays are articulated upwards for grabbing the sample and you can see our sample arm extends down there. Uh, I think you guys can, can you see my uh, mouse when I move the mouse around here? Cool. So you see we have uh, two solar panels. To give you an idea, each of these uh, solar panels is about two meters square. So it gives us about eight square meters of solar panel area. And then the spacecraft body itself is roughly um, two meters on each side. On this uh, side of the spacecraft right here is our science instrument deck where you can see all of our different science instruments. We have our sample return capsule, which is the small um, white dome right there. And then our high gain antenna, which is the large silvery dome right there. And this right here is our three meter long um, Tagasam arm. I'll talk all about these uh, in detail here in a sec. All right, so uh, here actually here's a photo of the vehicle assembly building where we were getting ready to um, move the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft and put it in the payload shroud that would go on top of the Atlas V rocket for a launch. You can see on the right-hand side there are several of our integration technicians uh, for scale. As mentioned, we have a full um, suite of uh, science instruments on there. I'll get into detail right here. So um, the ones, of course, that will look the most familiar to you all right now is our camera suite. We have a series of three science cameras. We have Polycam, which is essentially a large smith cassegrain um, telescope. We have MapCam, which is our color telescope. And then we have SamCam, which is um, a very, very specialized um, camera that when we bring the sample, um, when we collect the sample, SamCam's sole job in the entire mission is to specifically be targeted at where we'll be collecting the sample. So we get highly detailed images um, very close up. So both MapCam and PolyCam are made for studying the asteroid from a distance, um, but SamCam is made for those really close up shots. So when the um, spacecraft is only meters away from the asteroid surface, we'll still be in focus. We also have in the upper right-hand corner there the OLA, the OSIRIS-REx laser altimeter. It is a um, laser altimeter used to generate very, very detailed down to um, centimeter scale um, shape models of the asteroid. We have the OVIRS, the OSIRIS-REx visual infrared spectrometer, the OTES, the OSIRIS-REx thermal emissions spectrometer, and then the REXIS, which is our X-ray spectrometer. I do not remember their entire acronym. My apologies to the REXIS team. But um, OVIRS was made by Goddard Space Flight Center. OTES was made by the um, Arizona State University. REXIS was made by MI students at the MIT. It's actually a student-built experiment um, and student-run experiment on the OSIRIS-REx project. And then OLA was made by and contributed by the Canadian Space Agency. And then the camera suite was all built at the University of Arizona. So the University of Arizona, who was my employer when I was a science operations engineer, um, both were the principal investigators of the spacecraft, and then we also provided the um, primary science camera suite. So just a little uh, animation here of what it looks like when we actually map um, Bennu. So you might have noticed that all those instruments there are all on what we call the um, science um, payload deck. And so as the spacecraft is orbiting Bennu, we just very slowly rocket back and forth as it goes in its um, orbit. So we're not needing to spin the spacecraft to point all different instruments at it at different times. All the instruments are essentially lined up. So when we center that um, science payload deck at the, space, at the asteroid, all the instruments are collecting data at the same time. So then all we need to do in order to mosaic an area so say we have um, one of the target sites, like right there, is we just very gently rock the spacecraft back and forth using our reaction wheels. And sorry if I'm talking about terminology you guys might not understand. 
Um, so reaction wheels are essentially spinning um, weights in the spacecraft. And so by spinning these weights using electric motors, we can, um, through conservation of angular momentum, spin the spacecraft um, and point it without having to use any of the um, motors or rocket engines on the spacecraft. So it's a much uh, more precise and um, way of um, moving the spacecraft and it also doesn't consume um, a lot of fuel. Because if we're always um, turning the spacecraft using solely the um, thrusters on the spacecraft, we would go through a lot of fuel very quickly. Here's um, some of the um, images of what um, Bennu looks like. Again, so all of the different um, science instruments on the spacecraft all collect data in uh, different wavelengths. So we have the map cam, which does full color imaging at approximately one meter resolution in that photo. We have the OVIRS, which does um, its spectral analysis, the OTES, which is, does its thermal analysis. And then of course we have the OLA, which um, is it's the laser altimeter and it also um, this here is a surface slope map so essentially this map is showing what the slants are of the slope at different locations on Bennu. So we have lots of different ways of looking at the asteroid and then we combine all these images into what are called multi-spectral images to really bring out um, a lot of this uh, detail as we study the asteroid. And of course, the exciting thing that will happen in October of this year is sample acquisition. So you guys noticed earlier we had that long three meter arm with kind of what looks like um, an air filter from your car attached to the end of it. That's called the TAGSAM head. And in October of this year, we are going to very slowly drift the spacecraft down, tag the um, asteroid with the end of that um, sample collection device, the TAGSAM head blow nitrogen gas um, through that air filter to collect um, sample, tuck it away in what's called the sample return capsule, which will bring it safely back to the Earth, and then, uh, yeah, return to Earth. So um, we don't just have um, animations to show you, but here's actually um, a real test. So we tested the, since um, we only get three opportunities, we have enough nitrogen gas to make three attempts. We only actually want to do one if we can get away with it, but we have enough nitrogen gas to do three attempts at collecting this sample. And as you can see here, this is in one of the um, low pressure test chambers. We have a bunch of um, regolith. And this is showing um, in very, very, very slow motion, the device going down, the actuator pushing to trigger the uh, nitrogen gas blast, and then all the sample falling away as the um, tag SAM head comes off the asteroid. What is the time frame on that, Josh? What's our? What's the time frame? How how quickly is it doing um, this? Seconds. Yeah, it's really quick because again, um, so this is all happening as the spacecraft is drifting down. So this, um, since the uh, gravity of Bennu is so weak, the spacecraft drifts, drifts, drifts down. It tags. As it tags, it only has a few seconds. Um, as that arm is slowly compressing, so the arm articulates and slowly um bends downward. But um, if we were to take more than a few seconds to um, blow the nitrogen gas and collect the sample into the collection device, we would accidentally land on the asteroid, which we are not designed to do. We uh, do not want to land on the asteroid. We are high-fiving the asteroid. Right. And as you um, saw there, I can replay the video, but this just shows here um, an internal um, view of what it looks like inside that sample collection head. So the air comes down here. It blows and um, tries to disturb as much of the regolith as possible. That regolith then moves up here into the sample collection chamber, and there are various um, filters there that will allow the nitrogen gas to escape, but um, catch all the regolith as possible. And so the ideal sample size is uh, two centimeters in size. Um, so anything bigger than that will not be able to make it into the sample collection device, um, but we will, can collect stuff smaller than that. And we're hoping we can collect. Um, we're hoping to get um, let's see, eh, six grams of regolith, but we can collect in total up to two kilograms. Um, so our minimum is that sixty grams of regolith, but two, we can uh, have the possibility to get up to um, two kilograms. And here's another uh, test. This is just showing. Um, so we knew there's the potential. So, okay, what if we um, go down with this sample collection mechanism and there are big rocks in the way? And so one um, of the tests we did is using all sorts of different configurations, um, using the tag stamp head on the ground. Okay, so what if it lands on a big rock, but there's some um, sample of the two centimeter size next to it? 
how much of that were we still able to collect in that circumstance? And they did all of the possible permutations you can think of. Um, so this one was with um, a, a large 10 centimeter rock um, in the center, but we still successfully collected our sample. They also did, okay, what if we hit it at an angle and it's, um, here's the surface, here's the tag sand head, and we hit it like that, um, how much sample we get? And they went through all the possible permutations they could think of to look for um, what will lead to a successful sample collection. And then of course, um, we want to return the sample to the Earth. And so in September um, of 2023, due to or orbital mechanics, we know the exact day and hour and minute that the sample will be coming back to the Earth. Um, no matter what, it's coming back on that day, one way or another. Um, and so our sample return capsule will land in the Utah test and training range. Um, we have a large grid square actually in one of our offices with the um, guess of where it's gonna land, then the uncertainty ellipse, and everyone's kind of like putting wagers. No, I think it's gonna land in that square. I think it's gonna land in that square. So um, September 24th, 2023 is gonna be uh, very exciting for us and the team. Uh, it'll be uh, the payoff from a lot, of, a lot of work by a lot of people across the world. And then uh, the samples, after they're collected, will return to uh, the Johnson Space Center, where we have a sample curation facility. One question I get a lot um, when um, we talk to the public about this is, well, if you find something really cool in the samples when you analyze this, how will you know that this actually was on the asteroid and it wasn't um, contamination? So for example, we use hydrogen, hydrazine thrusters on the spacecraft. And, uh, hydrazine has decomposition products when you use the thruster, and so it's the possibility, of, hey, you might contaminate um, the collection device, you might contaminate the asteroid some, so how do you know that whatever you find is not uh, cross-contamination from the spacecraft? And one of the ways we do that is actually in the sample curation facility here at Johnson Space Center. I seem to be um, getting ready to see the sample, getting a job out here ahead of time, so I can uh, wait for it to uh, catch up to me. But they also have, um, in addition to all the containers where they'll store the sample for the long term, they also have kept um, pieces of the spacecraft from the entire um, time the spacecraft was being built all the way through launch. Um, so various spares and other parts that have gone through the same exact process that the rest of the spacecraft has. And these have been kept in very um, carefully um, monitored curation facilities and um, boxes that have very neutral um, atmospheres in them. So if we find something of interest and people want to say, well, that might just be some cross-contamination of the spacecraft, we can actually go and take these pieces that have the same um, history as the spacecraft and look at them and say, hey, are we seeing a contamination on this, this piece? So it's um, one of those interesting ways of identifying, hey, do you know that you really didn't um, pass that contamination on? And we fear, out, yes, we did. Um, and when you actually look at some of the uh, famous programs like the, um, the Mars missions or the uh, lunar missions, they also have done this as well. And a lot of times when you get those interesting science results and feel like, wait a minute, did we really find uh, that chemical signature? This is what they do. They go back and find those flight spares that have been kept in these um, sterile um, controlled environments and they look at those for any signs of contamination. And then one of the reasons we're um, bringing the sample back to Earth, so people are always are like, well, why do you need to, it's so much more expensive to do a mission and it um, constrains uh, the mission a lot to have to bring the sample all the way back to Earth. Why can't you just bring all the instruments with you? Well, look at this image here. So with that um, sample, it's gonna go to all these labs across the world with massive, massive instruments, um, various um, spectros um, spectroscopy, uh, all sorts of mass specs, electron microscopes, um, and all sorts of science instruments that we cannot fit on our spacecraft itself. And so we, um, by bringing that sample back to the Earth, we then, um, if we get at least to our minimum sample size, that will allow us to distribute the sample to these laboratories across the Earth using all of the science uh, instruments that are at humanity's disposal. And then also in the lower right-hand corner, um, one thing we do with these as well, um, with all NASA missions, is we reserve a little bit of the sample for the future. So we know that there will be um, better scientific devices in the future. Um, for example, even today, uh, I think only a few years ago, we opened up some of the lunar samples that had been collected in the Apollo era um, that they had kept in very um, carefully preserved conditions, several canisters they did not open because they knew that in the future, there might be um, follow-on studies using better science equipment that they might want to um, 
have some unaltered, untouched sample left over from. Um, and so we will be putting aside a um, large portion of sample, um, not just for the scientists of today, but for the scientists of tomorrow as well. All right, um, so we launched on September 8th, 2016. I'm now going to get away from all the, the plan for the mission and a little bit into um, what actually happens, uh, has happened so far. So we launched on September 8th, 2016. Um, mission was selected, um, just to give you an idea of how long it takes to get a mission together. So we were selected in 2011 as a New Frontiers mission. Um, but we're not going to get that sample back until 2023. So some scientists will have spent uh, most of their careers working on this mission. Um, and 2011 was not the first time OSIRIS-REx was proposed. It was originally proposed, I believe, 2005 or 2006 as a um, discovery mission. And it was rejected at that time um, for various reasons um, as a discovery mission. And so the team decided, okay, we need to make this mission more compelling. Um, at that time, that original proposal, I do not believe actually had a sample return. It was just called the OSIRIS mission. Um, and so we decided to um, make the mission more ambition, ambitious and apply for the New Frontiers um, mission program, which has a much higher budget than the Discovery program, but it's also much more competitive. And so um, we fixed up the proposal bunch and then added in this sample return um, to make the mission much more compelling. And we were selected in 2011. So um, try, try again. Eventually, um, things work out for you. We launched in uh, 2016 and the sample returned in 2023. So we arrived at Bennu in about uh, 2018. And, uh, we, the um, pro approach began in August of 2023 and then we finally arrived, uh, 20, uh, sorry, 2018. And then we arrived officially in December of 2018. We then went, uh, been doing asteroid operations for about the last three years. And then um, in 2021, we will do our departure. So after successfully collecting our sample and stowing it on the spacecraft, um, we have some, a very precise window that we need to leave the asteroid in order to successfully return to the Earth. Here's a little bit of our timeline for our science phase. So we started out with approach. Um, we approached the asteroid very, very slowly. So one thing we wanted to do um, in approaching the asteroid is study it um, and see if there were any um, dust plumes coming off the asteroid. We wanted to study, is Bennu an active asteroid? Does it, um, since we know it's carbon rich, it possibly has had um, interactions with water in the past. Maybe there's currently water or other volatiles on the asteroid. We wanted to look and see if there was any sort of dust plume coming off the asteroid. And then another thing we really wanted to be careful before we got too close to the asteroid was looking for moons or other um, objects that might be orbiting um, Bennu. We do know that many asteroids out there are binaries, um, or even if they aren't um, very similar to size, sometimes you can have um, very small bodies orbiting a much larger asteroid. And so before we got the spacecraft close, we wanted to do a very detailed survey. And we actually have um, professional astronomers employed um, on the science team who actually worked with the Catalina Sky Survey people in Tucson to look for um, any potential um, moons or objects in orbit of the asteroid before we arrived. We then began our preliminary survey phase where we um, wanted a very low resolution map of the entire um, asteroid in order to plan some of our later um, studies. We then practiced going into orbit, something called Orbital A. That was our very first time we orbited Bennu, and we set a Guinness Book of World Records for the smallest planetary body that has ever been orbited by a spacecraft. Um, Bennu is by far and large the um, smallest body to ever been orbited. Um, to give you uh, an idea of the escape velocity from um, Bennu, I don't have the exact number mem memorized off the top of my head, but it is comparable with the um, top speed of a um, Horse, uh, horse, ugh. horse fish. Um, what do you call those? Anyway, uh, um, we then went to the detailed survey phase. So this is when we got our um, started to get our high resolution images of the entire asteroid, and then into our recon phase. Um, so we took the data we got in both our preliminary survey and our detailed survey phase, and um, tried to um, figure out what were the most interesting sites on the entire asteroid. And then during our recon phase, we did um, sorties. So we came out of orbit and then came really, really close to the asteroid and took very high resolution imagery of the asteroid um, in these very um, 
scientifically interesting areas um, to determine what would be the best place to collect a sample on the asteroid. And then now we are in our rehearsals. We've done all of our um, detailed science studies, all of our um, reconnaissance of the asteroid, we've mapped it, and now we're getting ready for collecting that sample. So all the science team are slowly um, rolling off the mission and we are testing. We just completed our checkpoint um, rehearsal, which I'll talk about in a sec. And then we will do our match point rehearsal. Then we will try to collect our sample. Seahorse, thank you very much. Seahorse. <laughs> Yeah, my mind has too much um, International Space Station and OSIRIS-REx going on right now, but thank you to the chat for chiming in. Seahorse, that's what I meant to say. Thank you. <laughs> chat to the rescue. Uh, so in August 2018, so as I mentioned, we have a number of astronomers out there um, who were working on the mission, and they were analyzing our images as we were um, coming into the asteroid. And we have um, the approach phase of mission officially began in August of 2018 when we had first light of the asteroid. So you can see there it's about three pixels across, I believe, in this image, but um, that is the asteroid Bennu. Um, so if any of you have used the image processing um, software DS9, actually, uh, that's what a lot of the um, scientists were using. And so um, when these images came down, uh, suddenly had a whole bunch of astronomers really interesting uh, processing and stacking all their images, trying to see, can we see it? Can we see it? Can we see it? Um, you know, a lot of very excited uh, people doing a lot of um, astro astro yeah, astronomical image processing, very similar to what you guys do at WAS, probably. And then um, this video here is probably, um, I can't explain to you how exciting it was to sit in the Science Operations Center in um, Tucson and watch over the course of several months as um, the asteroid grew from only a few pixels in size all the way to being a full world. So um, this, these images were taken at um, a variety of different times between August and December of 2018. Um, so that's the final image you get there is December of 2018. And we got to watch it grow all the way from that three pixel dot until it grew into an entire world. But um, I will say um, it is surprising how much analysis people can do on only three pixels. So uh, I would say the number of meetings we had in August where the scientists were trying to pull as much detail and as much uh, information out as they could of only that three pixel wide little blob, it was uh, quite fascinating to watch uh, how much we could overanalyze three pixels, or nine pixels actually, three by three. <laughs> And so here's um, our actual, um, our asteroid. Here's Bennu in high resolution. Um, this is some data, I believe, from detailed surveys showing you a full rotation um, of the asteroid there. You can see um, we were in a terminator orbit at the time we took these images. And it, this um, goes through one 4.3 hour orbit. It's a really, really interesting asteroid um, scientifically. Uh, Though I will say that when we first saw it, it definitely gave some people um, some heart palpitations because it is rocky. Um, I think one of the scientists, who I won't say exactly who it was, but uh, when he first saw the asteroid, described it um, as it looks like what was left over after a really mu messy construction crew was done on the highway and just dumped a pile of gravel on the side of the highway. Um, it's a very, very rocky asteroid, um, very unlike a lot of the other asteroids we've studied to date. So we're very used to seeing um, asteroids that have very, very smooth surfaces, lots of very fine grained material um, on the surface. But um, Bennu is very, very different. It's um, like a large rubble heap. It's a gravel pile, um, lots of very, very large um, particles and boulders. Um, one of the biggest on the you can see coming around on the side there on the southern hemisphere is about um, 50 meters across, um, which is massive when you consider that the entire asteroid, that's about one-tenth the total diameter of the asteroid. So very interesting world to study. Yep. And so this is just again comparing um, so what we knew beforehand and the data we got from um, the Arecibo telescope to what um, Bennu actually turned out to be. And uh, surprisingly it was our data from ahead of time was really, really good to the point that um, while this um, graphic is not actually rotating the 3D model from Arecibo, um, that large rock I talk about that you can see there on the um, southern hemisphere, there it is, um, that's about 50 meters in uh, diameter, that actually is visible 
on the Arecibo data. And um, one of the scientists um, who took that Arecibo data, when we actually got the detailed images, he just leapt out of his seat because he was so excited because he'd been advocating for a number of years that, hey, this big rock, this is actually something. This isn't just an artifact in my data. It actually exists. Um, there is some sort of bulge in the southern hemisphere of this asteroid. And lo and behold, it actually turned out to be true. So um, this is really cool to see um, how accurate all this uh, radar data from Arecibo turned out to be. Other things we discovered so far, so as mentioned, um, there's lots of boulders up to about 60 meters in size. Uh, sorry, I was a little bit low there saying 50 meters. Um, it very, very um, rocky. Um, one of the cool things we noticed, um, this is almost right away from the spectrum, um, from the spectrometers on the spacecraft, but we definitely saw um, evidence of past water alteration and hydrated minerals. Um, it's called the 2.7 micrometer um, band, water band, um, and the spectrometer, specifically the ovary spectrometer, picked that up almost right away um, when we started doing our detailed um, survey of, this, um, of the asteroid, which um, got people really, really excited. Uh, we also noticed that there are a lot of um, chondritic meteorites here on Earth that are very close uh, matches to Bennu, um, specifically the CL and, and CM chondrites. Um, we all, and then also on the Yurkovsky effect. Um, so there are two things um, regarding the Yurkovsky effect. Um, one that's called the Yurkovsky O'Keefe Radzimsky Paddock effect. My apologies, I'm probably ridiculously mispronouncing those names, but um, that's the element of the Yurkovsky effect that changes the rotation rate of the asteroid. And we figured out that um, for Bennu, the effect is about, it changes Bennu's rotation rate by about one second every 100 years. And then the Yarkovsky effect, that's where, um, as you guys might remember um, from your basic physics classes, light uh, has momentum. And so since asteroids are spinning, they're getting heated up by the sun, but as they spin, the um, heat is then being emitted on the dark side of the, um, of the asteroid. And so that acts kind of like a mini thruster on the asteroid very slowly over time, changing the asteroid's orbit. And one, we had a lot of theoretical models out there, but one thing we really wanted to do with Bennu is narrow down and precisely determine the Yarkovsky effect on Bennu, both um, the impact on Bennu's rotation rate, because how fast it's rotating will change um, the effect, how much of an effect that thruster of the Yarkovsky effect is having, and then also um, quantify how much the Yarkovsky effect is altering Bennu's um, position. Because um, as you guys might have heard in the past, when we talk about asteroids potentially uh, hitting the Earth, we'll say, okay, there's a small window of several meters that this asteroid needs to pass through um, for it to eventually hit Earth one day. Um, but when we have large uncertainties in the asteroid's position or the asteroid's orbit, we can only give you like a one in a thousand or a one in 200 chance. We have very high uncertainty in if the asteroid will one day hit the Earth. And so we were able to determine um, that the Yarkovsky effect on Bennu um, alters it by about 185 kilometers over 12 years, or 131 feet per day, which is a fairly big impact when you think that these asteroids are out there for thousands and thousands of years. And so over time, that could significantly change where Bennu is going to be in a given day or time um, and change between Earth having a very good day and a very bad day. And then perhaps saving um, one of the most exciting things for last, Bennu is ejecting particles. So I mentioned to you how um, earlier in the um, approach phase, we had something called the natural satellite search. We were searching for anything in orbit of um, the asteroid Bennu. And long story short, during that um, survey, we didn't really find anything. And the astronomers were all bored. They're like, okay, our job is done. No, there's nothing in orbit of the, um, the asteroid. But then um, one of our astronomers was going back through some of the data trying to match up the stars um, actually in the background with um, known stars just to determine what we're seeing in the star field in the background. And he noticed that there were a whole bunch of bright things um, in the field that were not stars. They did not match any known star pattern. Um, and he went down to very low limiting magnitudes. And uh, he then went back through the um, images and found that there were these ejection events, um, large um, plumes of um, little particles, very, very small in size, like we're talking the size of grains of sand to about the size of a pea being ejected um, from the asteroid in what were called ejection events. And we could actually look back through images and actually catch several of these ejection events um, only a few hours after they happened, um, like the one you're seeing right here. Um, and this 
took the entire team by surprise. And it was a, whoa, 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 what's, what's going on here? Because we've never witnessed anything like this on a planetary body before, um, at least not on an asteroid. We do know um, things like comets um, have a very almost steady state of um, particles being ejected because of the, um, the volatilization of various uh, and the sublimation of various volatiles on the surface. But asteroids aren't supposed to be very active, and we didn't think Bennu was after our approach phase. But then it was very interesting to find that um, there were these particles being flung off um, Bennu and orbiting for periods of several minutes to uh, several uh, days at a time. And so three big theories were proposed out there. One is that um, these might be caused by um, meteorite impacts. So we might have some um, meteors um, impacting Bennu and then blowing um, rocks up and you might have these particle ejection events. Another theory that was proposed was thermal fracturing. So as mentioned, um, Bennu has a 4.3 hour rotation period. That is a lot of um, thermal stresses. So if you just think you have all these rocks out there going from really extremely hot to extreme cold over and over and over again for thousands and thousands of years, and eventually maybe they break and um, eject some of these particles uh, into orbit. And then the last uh, theory was, of course, um, maybe volatiles. So possibly um, as the um, Bennu rotates from the dark side into the light side, um, or as Bennu gets um, closer towards perihelion in its orbit around the sun. So perihelion, again, is where the asteroid is at its closest period in its orbit. Perhaps um, various volatiles, like maybe there's some um, solid um, ice underneath the surface, are evaporating and um, pushing particles um, off the asteroid. And so we determined that um, by the most recent paper, I can't, I, again, I can't go into more detail than they've released in the public science papers, but they've, um, we've definitely determined that thermal fracturing does occur on Bennu. And we've determined that um, it's highly unlikely that these are due to volatiles evaporating uh, or sublimating on the surface, sorry. Um, because we looked um, at all sorts of configurations. We looked at, okay, is there a relationship between these events in the day-night cycle to perihelion versus aphelion of the asteroid and could not find any um, link there. And so that leaves us with um, the possibility of micrometeoroids or small meters and things hitting the surface and calling us the injection events and the thermal fracturing. Um, so really, really, really cool. And um, I, I know this might seem like I'm spending a lot of time just talking about this one image, but this was definitely one of the most exciting periods for the entire um, team because this is something brand new that we discovered that no one knew about before we went to this asteroid. Uh, this is just uh, showing some of the orbital terminations they did. So um, one of the things we wanted to do with Bennu is really pin down um, the mass distribution and the center of uh, mass of the asteroid, um, both for our purposes, for um, taking the sample, because we need to have its gravity field very, very well constrained in order for us to um, precisely target um, the area of the asteroid we want to grab the sample from, and then also from a um, matter of determining what is the internal composition of the asteroid. Um, and so our original plan was we were going to mainly determine this via um, orbiting the spacecraft around the asteroid and seeing how that orbit changed with time. Now that doesn't give us a whole bunch of data to go on because we only have one spacecraft. What was really cool about these particle ejection events is suddenly you have dozens to hundreds of objects in small, in all sorts of orbits around um, the asteroid. And you can use this to um, narrow down and improve on your gravity model. And so it allowed us to get a much more precise model of um, the gravity around um, Bennu and its composition than we probably would have been able to do otherwise. So it's one of those interesting little follow-on effects. You make one discovery that then leads to um, further uh, discoveries, which is really cool. Also, another interesting thing is comparison of Bennu and Ryugu. Um, so Ryugu is uh, an asteroid that was explored by the Hayabusa 2 spacecraft, um, which is currently in the process of returning its sample from um, Ryugu to Earth. I think their sample returns in December of this year, if I'm correct. And then um, Bennu. Um, so of course, um, the first thing everyone wants to do is compare them. And they're actually very comparable. So um, as you can see on the right-hand side, I put some statistics about the two asteroids. Um, their orbital inclinations, actually that's incorrect there. Um, 
it should be six for um, Ryuga, I believe, and only f and 5.9 for Bennu. So I made a typo there. But um, their orbital inclinations are almost um, dead on. They're almost precisely the same. Their orbital periods are extremely similar. Um, Ryugu is a type C asteroid, and Bennu is a type B asteroid. Um, so Bs are actually um, uh, is a subtype of type C asteroids. And what it essentially comes down to is Ryugu is slightly drier than Bennu. Um, they are about the same distance um, from the sun, so their average distance to Ryugu is about 1.2 AU and Bennu is 1.1 AU. And then um, since there is a large difference in their size, their um, period of rotation is uh, quite different. So Bennu has only a 4.3 hour rotation, whereas Ryugu has 7.6. But the period rotation is also dependent on its uh, size, and Ryugu is much bigger at 900 meters, so it's um, almost twice the diameter of Bennu. Now, one of the cool things, and I think they just, in, it was in a paper in June 1st we um, talked about, is we're leaning towards um, Ryugu and Bennu might have had a single parent body that led to the formation of both asteroids. So both these asteroids are very similar in composition. Um, Bennu is just slightly wetter, shall we say, than um, Ryugu. Um, and they also look very similar. So um, people have found different ways to describe them um, from a spinning top to, um, I like to describe it I, um, as a D Dungeons and Dragons nerd. I prefer to describe it more of kind of looks to me like a D4, like an eight sided die. Uh, uh, sorry, D8, an eight sided die. Um, it kind of looks almost like a diamond uh, shape. So you have that large equatorial bulge in the center, um, and then it kind of forms more towards the tip at the top. And so um, the two asteroids are very, very similar in shape if um, Ryugu is a little bit bigger. And so um, we one of the leading theories is they have a common parent body. In the past, there was probably some larger um, parent body um, orbiting somewhere between the orbits of Mars and Earth that was disrupted at some point. So something probably hit it or it tore itself apart. And um, the resulting um, debris formed the two bodies of Bennu and Ryugu. And so um, at the time, they were probably um, relatively close to one another, but then over time, their orbits started to differ very slightly from different um, gravitational interactions. But, um, so yeah, uh, that's one of the leading theories right now that was just announced back in June. Uh, Ryugu and Bennu are most likely have a common origin and are very, very similar, very um, asteroids. And for the entire um, process, I should say both the Hayabusa 2 team and the OSIRIS-REx team have been working very closely together. Um, we have had a lot of exchange between our various scientists on the two missions, um, and it's been very, um, a great um, camaraderie between the two teams, uh, passing on lessons learned and what we've learned and um, from operating around our respective asteroids. I mentioned uh, we do have possible analog meteorites um, here on Earth. So the CM2s and CM1s and the CL1 are our best um, analogs to the composition of Bennu at the moment. Of course, once we actually get the sample and bring it back to Earth, we'll be able to do a much more detailed comparison. Um, but those are our leading um, candidates for analog meteorites. So if you have any uh, chunks of this uh, sitting at home, uh, you might have a piece of Bennu, uh, or at least um, Bennu and Ryugu's parent body. So that being the idea that um, whenever this disruption um, activity happens that broke up the parent body, um, potentially some of the matter went into forming Ryugu, some went into forming Bennu, and then some landed on Earth as uh, meteorites. So um, there are also some huge impact craters on Bennu. Uh, the largest crater is on the Equatorial Ridge. It's about 130 meters in size, or about the size of the Great Pyramid at Giza. Um, one of the other interesting things we've determined uh, in studying Bennu um, is, as you might um, remember from your basic planetary science or astronomy classes, one of the ways we can age surfaces and determine how old the surface is on something like an asteroid or the moon is by the amounts of craters. And so the more craters there are on a surface, the older that surface is, because um, a younger surface, a surface that has been um, reshaped by some sort of um, process, whether it's um, re regolith falling on it or some sort of um, weathering process like the winds on Mars, um, a younger surface will have less craters. Um, so it's basically a younger, a blanker slate. And, but one of the interesting things about um, both Bennu and Ryugu is that equatorial bulge that's sticking out in the, um, along the equator is actually some of the oldest 
of surfaces on both Ryugu and Bennu. It has the highest density of craters of anywhere on um, both asteroids, which is a little bit surprising. People were kind of thinking that maybe it would be younger and maybe um, material would migrate down from um, the top of the asteroid down to the equator over time. And so people were kind of expecting that maybe that equatorial bulge would be the uh, youngest material on the um, asteroid, but actually it turned out to be the oldest. Also, as mentioned, um, so I'm going to flick through some um, images here in the next few slides. I know people are probably getting a little bit antsy, but uh, it's uh, Bennu is a massive boulder field, um, lots and lots of boulders all over the place. Um, right here, this is about um, 40 meters in um, diameter, this image here, and that uh, large boulder there in the center is about 7.1 meters in size, or about the size of a pickup truck. So. Um, from a sampleability standpoint, not much um, looks very sampleable here. So like you might have some fine grain material right here and maybe some right here, but there is not a lot here to sample. Um, and so we really had to do a lot of uh, study um, picking out the individual sites on this uh, asteroid to figure out where we could actually potentially grab a sample from. So uh, originally, um, our initial um, plan was that the navigation team told us that um, if we pick a 30 meter um, diameter circle somewhere on the asteroid that we want to collect a sample from, they could um, guarantee that we would get our sample somewhere within that 30 meter planning circle. Needless to say, um, with a 30 meter planning circle, there is no spot on this asteroid where you can actually um, find fine grain material across that entire 30 meter segment. There's just so many boulders across the surface of this asteroid. Uh, for example, in this one shot here, um, these are smooth boulders, not very sampleable. Uh, looks like you got some fine grain material here, a little fine grain material here. But yeah, if, if we, all we know is that we're gonna tag somewhere in this, more likely than not, we're not going to get a sample. We're not going to get anything um, that we can bring back to Earth, and we're just going to waste that nitrogen gas. As I mentioned earlier, remember, we only get three tries, so we really have to make sure that we uh, try to get it on that first shot. And so the navigation team, as I mentioned, we have a much better gravity model than we expected, thanks to all these particle events, and um, thanks to some of the very hard work of the navigation team, they were able to narrow down the uncertainty to a five meter um, tag target zone. So um, if we give them a five meter circle somewhere on the asteroid, they can essentially guarantee that they are going to get um, our tag sample head somewhere within that five meter um, circle. So this actually opens up a whole bunch of opportunities for us. Uh, as you can see, that circle right there is about the size of that nice patch of um, small grain material right there. And there are a whole bunch of different um, sites around the asteroid that using this new five meter radius, uh, we are able to sample. So that was a really exciting uh, development. So, all right, we have all these detailed maps of the asteroids. So now we need to select our sample sites. And so how do we do that? Um, first of all, is safety. Number one is safety. You don't want to endanger the spacecraft. Don't break the multi-million dollar spacecraft. Rule number one. Um, we also wanted um, sampleability. We want to make sure that we have some of this fine grain material there. It doesn't matter if we tag, if we're just um, going up on a smooth rock face, we need to make sure there's lots of fine grain material that we can sample. Um, deliverability, um, how likely is it that we are going to be able to deliver the tag SAM to the exact spot where the sampleable material is? And then also um, our last consideration was the science value, unfortunately. It's an important consideration, but it does come down last um, in our criteria. And so safety, sampleability, and deliverability were all um, first, and then we, when all things are equal, then consider the relative science value of the different sites. And so we have selected our sites. We have um, our primary site, which is called Nightingale. Uh, to give you um, scale, remember the spacecraft, the panels there are about two meters in diameter, and the spacecraft itself is about uh, two meters in diameter, so that's about eight meters right there from end to end on the spacecraft, to give us on the size. Uh, so Nightingale, it's a um, very uh, high. It's almost near um, Bennu's North Pole on the asteroid. It's made up of, it's a crater on the asteroid. It's made up of very fine grain material. And one of the interesting things is it has one of the highest differences in albedo or reflectivity. So we have um, some of the brightest things on the entire surface of the asteroid. You can see these little very, very bright rocks there. And it also has some of the darkest material on the entire asteroid. You can see kind of like the darker um, 
material right here. Um, so both some of the brightest and uh, darkest material in the entire asteroid or in this uh, crater. That's really cool because it means it probably has a large variety in composition. So by um, selecting a sample from the Nightingale site, we're likely to um, get a lot of both the bright and the dark rocks and be able to turn what exactly is making them bright or dark. Now I should say, Bright and dark, very, very relative terms. If um, all these images have been stretched a lot to bring out um, all the detail um, characteristics. Um, I can't give you the exact specifics of the stretch on this particular image, but to give you an idea, the average reflectivity of Bennu is about 4%. Only 4% of the light that reflects off, uh, that hits the surface of Bennu is reflected off. Um, we actually partnered with a local brewing company in um, Tucson and they made a very, very, very dark porter um, that was the exact albedo of the asteroid. They took all of our science data and to turn the exact um, albedo and then turn that into a beer. And it was um, one of the darkest porters I ever see. It's almost black. Um, and so when you're seeing all these photos, um, do take that into consideration that when we say the very, very brightest rocks, we're not talking something like mica, we're talking about essentially a black rock that's slightly less black than everything around it. Um, very, very, very dark asteroid um, and very um, yeah, low albedo. And also one of the interesting things too about these sites, so since this is a crater, it's also a very young surface. So um, since the crater is still visible there and there's lots of this fine grain material, it's likely a very young surface. So we're studying more of the um, younger, the more recent history of the asteroid as opposed to some of the older um, material. We're just gonna zoom in at a few like areas of interest. Um, so this is a high res image. I think this is down to maybe about two centimeters per pixel, I think on this particular image. We can see um, just a lot of the detail that's brought out here. We have these really interesting um, boulders with very uh, textured surfaces here. Uh, lots of little fine grain material scattered about here. Uh, and also what you might notice right down here is we notice in a lot of the rocks around Bennu, all these faults and these cracks. Um, and a lot of them are suspected to be thermal fractures from all the heating and uh, cooling repeatedly over and over and over again, every 4.3 hours for billions of years um, has fractured a lot of these rocks up. And so as we look at these high resolution images, we're noticing more and more and more on these rocks that they're all fr um, thermal fractured all over the place. And also interesting too, as you're looking at some of these bigger rocks too, you'll notice um, there's like little piles of um, small material on top of the rock. And so that's interesting too, somehow that material needed to get on top of that big rock. Uh, and so a lot of that we think might be from some of these particle ejection events, something gets ejected and then lands elsewhere on the asteroid, maybe on top of one of these big boulders. And again, when I'm, you're seeing very um, big differences here between that very dark um, rock and that very bright rock, in reality, um, the differences is very slight, but these images have all been stretched to bring out the, uh, the differences. Um, we can also look at one of these other fractured rocks. Again, I mentioned there's um, so many fractured rocks across this asteroid. Um, everything from big rocks to small rocks, all with all these nice little fractures. Geologists will sit here for hours just looking at any of these individual images, and it's really cool. All the, again, I'm an engineer, not a scientist, so if you want a detailed explanation of the history of an individual rock, might need to go to one of the geologists for that, but um, they are very cool images. And um, yeah, this image is here, um, including a little bit of the dark boulder, but then more importantly in this image, just going back a slide to see, this is actually including part of our tag site. So that's um, the area that we're thinking about is where we would like the spacecraft to go. The exact five meter um, circle within that, we haven't quite determined yet, but um, that in general is where we want to tag. And as you can see in here, Lots and lots of fine grain material. So it's about two centimeters per pixel. And um, as mentioned, that's about what we're looking for in grain size for our sample collection mechanism. And you can see there are lots of sections here where you have very fine grain material that is down to the pixel level. So we're very confident that um, there is sampleable material here. Some more pretty images, again showing we have lots of very fine grain material throughout these images. I in particular like this rock. It's very, very textured there compared to everything else. A lot of our other rocks are very bland. They might have a texture, um, some bumpy surface, but all the same color, but that, this one is a very interesting rock there. Everyone has their favorite rock. If you're doing asteroid mission, everyone's got their favorite rock on the asteroid, I'll tell you that. 
And then here is um, our backup sample site, which is called Osprey. I included it because it is near and dear to my heart. I actually worked the commands to take the images of this um, sample site. So it had to make it in. It, made, it didn't make it as primary sample site, but it made as backup and it just has a special place in my heart. For anyone who prefers Nightingale, you're entitled to your opinion, but Osprey will always be the best site in my opinion. Um, and it's also another impact crater uh, on the asteroid. What's very interesting about um, Osprey compared to Nightingale, you might notice. Uh, first of all, you can always identify the Osprey site because it has this very, very big rock sitting there at the top at about the 12 o'clock position. You might notice it has this dark blemish and it's almost the exact center of the crater. And some people have been very interested in what's causing this dark blemish there. So it's um, very different than all of the other material around it. Again, you have a lot of those bright rocks and dark rocks all scattered throughout the crater. But then in almost the exact center of the crater, you have this big dark blemish there. And so people are very curious what's causing that. Is it something that happened after the crater? It's part of the formation of the crater itself? Is it maybe some underlying material that was darker that got exposed by the crater? Uh, no one's quite sure. Um, there haven't been any um, papers out there yet about it, So it's, um, but it's very unique. Um, we haven't seen this in too many of uh, the craters out there, so people are very interested in what caused that dark blemish. So if we potentially collected a sample from that dark blemish, we might be able to narrow that down. Also, it has um, a very strong signature for carbon-rich material. Um, the second, uh, the strongest um, signature for carbon-rich um, material, again, material that might have been altered by water in the past um, of the entire asteroid. And here, so I mentioned recently, we've been practicing for um, our tag, and that's what this um, little animation here is. Um, it's some um, images from when we were coming in to um, test, um, it's called our checkpoint rehearsal at the Nightingale site. And so in this image, the Nightingale site is actually up there at the very top. And so we're getting close, but we don't go all the way down. Um, this got um, relatively close to the surface, 65 meters. That's the closest we've been to the asteroid yet. But guess what? We're going to get a lot closer. Um, so next coming up um, for OSIRIS-REx is we have the match point rehearsal in August, uh, on August 11th, 2020. That's when we come down to um, so as you can see here, we first start out in orbit of the asteroid. We then initiate a burn at this point to leave orbit and put ourselves on a trajectory to come very close uh, to the asteroid, um, to what we call our checkpoint site. That's about 65 meters from the surface of the asteroid. At that point, we then initiate another burn, which sends us down to the match point site. We're trying to very precisely match the rotation of the asteroid. So from our perspective, relative to the asteroid, we want the spacecraft to be dropping straight down. So we need to um, get rid of our extra um, lateral motion. So we are just coming straight down at that tag site. And then we reach a point called uh, match point, which is right above the site, only 25 meters from the surface. And then in August, we won't quite go all the way. We'll get to that match point um, location where we've matched the rotation we're right above the site, only 25 meters away, and burn our thrusters to back away. Um, again, we want to do this because we want um, there to be no uncertainty, no risk in going in for these sites. So that's one thing um, that you learn throughout any of these space missions, whether it's human spaceflight or robotic flight, spaceflight, test, test, test. And so only introduce one unknown or as few unknowns as you can each time. So that's why we test going to the checkpoint first, then we go back, look at our data, go to match point, look at our data, and then finally go all the way in for tag. And so in October on 20th of 2020, we will do our tag. Fingers crossed. All right, I'm probably putting everyone to sleep, but um, maybe a little bit more lightheaded, uh, lighthearted stuff, talking a little bit as, so this was my very first actual space flight mission. And I just wanna share a little bit of my perspectives as um, a first time, a first timer and a former WAS TNG member. Uh, one of the really interesting things is the, how long it takes to develop commands for a mission like this. So um, since the round trip um, time some varies from anywhere from um, 20 to 40 minutes to get a command to the spacecraft and back. And so because of that, you need to make sure everything has been tested and tested and tested and looked over as many um, times as possible before you send that to the spacecraft. Um, so from the time that that scientist says that they wanna take a picture of that rock, it's about an eight week timeline before we actually end up sending that command to the spacecraft and the command is executed. Um, and so 
as my job as a science operations engineer is actually shepherding the commands through that eight week uh, process. And uh, everything is checked, checked, and checked again. Um, dozens and dozens of times and even the final products right before we send it these things have been looked at by people dozens and dozens of times and they're checked again um, it's not because we think that any individual person uh, has made a mistake but it's acknowledgement that we all make mistakes and the consequences of mistake are so great um, some people are mentioning um, can you control the space station or can you control the um, Osiris Rex from home and the surprising answer is a lot of it yes there are some very specific things that do need to be done on site um, such as sending up some commands but for um, the vast majority of our work we actually were able to trans uh, transition to um, remote work very easily uh, at least for Osiris Rex part of that is because um, so we are orbiting an asteroid and we don't just stop orbiting the asteroid on the weekends. And so we had um, every single weekend throughout the entire mission, we've had people on console and on uh, duty to monitor a day coming down from the spacecraft and raise the red flag if something's uh, going wrong because the spacecraft doesn't stop flying just for the, uh, the weekends. Um, or as I had to break news to my mom and my dad, who I know are um, watching this uh, right now, but uh, yeah, the spacecraft didn't stop flying for the holidays either. So um, yeah. I, I'm sorry for missing Christmas, but spacecraft doesn't stop. Uh, and then also one of the other fun things too is the um, team superstitions and traditions. So you always hear these um, recounting of um, stories from like the um, JPL control room where they always have the big jar of peanuts. And um, it's easy enough to foo to uh, laugh at it like, yeah, 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 right, they do that. But they really do. Um, each team develops their own unique traditions and um, superstitions as well. One of ours um, dates back to when the cameras were first being built at the um, University of Arizona. And one of the instrument scientists, every single Friday when the camera was being built, brought in donuts. But then um, when the camera was successfully built and delivered to um, the spacecraft, they're like, wait, are we still gonna have donuts? Well, camera was built successfully, we brought in donuts. Correlation, causation, we better keep bringing in donuts. And so for the entire length of the mission, we have had donuts every single Friday. Um, and when we transitioned to COVID-19 remote work, many people still ate donuts on Friday. And there may have been donuts in all of our presentations just to make sure we were still meeting that requirement of having donuts on Fridays. Uh, so it's interesting those little uh, team superstitions and traditions that develop. Um, we also, of course, had our team mascots. So you can see uh, here the, um, the penguin that is pretending to be a dinosaur. Uh, her name is Penrex. She was actually previously the team mascot for the IceSat mission. Um, and then once IceSat um, left the clean room up at the MSA in Colorado, she decided that um, asteroids were pretty interesting too. So she put on a dinosaur disguise because she heard there was this Osiris Rex mission uh, coming up and uh, infiltrated the mission and became our team mascot. And like any stuffed animals, I'm um, sure all of you who have uh, children can testify, um, they seem to propagate and uh, multiply. And so we have her husband here, Teddy um, Rex Penn, who is a dinosaur pretending to be a uh, penguin, and a whole bunch of their family and friends that have very quickly proliferated. Actually, I think that photo is from about a year or two ago, and the number of stuffed animals we have there probably has doubled since then. But it's interesting, those little um, superstitions and traditions that develop in a team like this. Um, so additional resources, so wrapping up here, um, all of our latest news and press releases, you can of course find on asteroidmission.org in the latest news section. That will have all of our press releases and science papers as they come out. Um, on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram, uh, make sure to check us out at Osiris Rex. And then for any of you who have a 3D printer out there, um, you can actually 3D print your own model of Bennu. So we have um, 3D uh, STL files of Bennu in several different resolutions. Um, so if you want to own your own asteroid, you can either print it out on your own 3D printer or uh, upload the file to your local 3D printer um, service and get a copy of your own. Then I'll leave you guys with um, this 3D rendering. Um, so this is actually um, a flyover of our tag site to kind of give you, it's hard to tell from the 2D images, but to really give you an idea of um, what the site is like um, geologically and um, elevation wise. Uh, so this is taking the elevation data, I believe it's our 75 centimeter or um, data from the um, 
laser altimeter. So when we were doing our passes, the laser altimeter collected this data, and then it was imported into um, the graphics program along with the relative um, albedos from the um, visual imagery. And they used that to combine to make this uh, 3D flyover. You really get an idea of the perspective of how small this crater is, and you have these massive rocks looming over it. Uh, one of those large um, rocks in the lower right-hand corner there was actually nicknamed by the team Mount Doom because it was just looked so large and foreboding um, sitting over the crater like that. All right, thank you all. Uh, I guess we can open up to questions and uh, I just wanted to leave you with my um, personal uh, setup these days. So I, uh, I'm pining for my skies back in Tucson where it's clear 95% of the time as we have this beautiful comet over us right now and I've had nothing but thunder showers for the last few weeks. So I'm definitely uh, missing my setup there at Karchner Cavern State Park in Tucson. <laughs> That's nice. What uh, Your dad uh, was texting me too and asked me to ask you what kind of other telescopes do you have? What else, what else are you using? Uh, so um, my main telescope right there is an Edge, Edge HD um, 1100 um, using a um, ZW ASI 183MC as my camera mounted at prime focus uh, with a Hyperstar um, version 3, I believe. And then I also use you know, CGEM mounts. Um, I did previously have a um, LX200 um, EMC, but I sold that before moving out here uh, to Houston. So. This is my prime instrument right now. I'm just, um, I've got I've perfected the actual observation. Now I'm, uh, as all those of you do astrophotography, I'm slowly learning uh, that it's not just setting up the uh, telescope, but learning all that detailed um, processing is the uh, the real kicker to bring some, to make some beautiful images. So, working through uh, on all these cloudy nights I have right now here in Houston, I'm uh, working on learning how to process all my data I collected when I was in Tucson. Uh, Michael Southern had just asked a second ago too. When uh, when are you planning on coming back to Stellafay? <laughs> so hopefully uh, we'll see. Uh, I know this year, unfortunately, COVID nineteen, but uh, maybe um, at a Stellafay soon, I'll be able to uh, meet you all at the Stellafay. Uh, both uh, see you all again, who I knew from my WAS TNG days, and then uh, meet many of the new members that have joined since then. I definitely would love to make out to a Stellafay. Unfortunately, when I was in France and when I was uh, always in our eight week cycle for Osiris Rex. Um, I was not able to take the time off, but uh, hopefully now with a new job, I'll be able to work it into one of the schedules. One of the interesting things about that eight-week cycle I was talking about, so um, we always have commands um, in an eight-week cycle. Uh, each engineer is assigned one week of commands, and that week of commands is in that eight-week cycle, and you always have a week that's somewhere in those eight-week cycles. And so you, of that week, you maybe have two weeks that you're allowed to take vacation on because other times you have responsibilities. So it's um, very rewarding your experience, but it's very restrictive in your uh, time off. So unfortunately I wasn't able to get up Stelfane uh, for quite a while. I think the last time I attended was probably... That's when, uh, it's when John Davis lit up the, uh, the field, remember? <laughs> well, uh, 2009, <laughs> yeah. it was around there. Yeah, John had uh, lit up the entire field with his, uh, with his uh, car lights. So I remember that. No comment. <laughs> 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 Quick comment right. about the meteorite uh, tie-in, yeah. and uh, that uh, uh, those are CI meteorites. Oh, CI. And uh, those happen to be the ones that are closest in uh, non-volatiles composition to the sun. So uh, they're very uh, pretty rare and pretty special. Cool. All right, looking through uh, some of the other questions that came from chat. Um, how much would a 300 pound man weigh on Bennu? Not very much. Um, I don't know the exact numbers for you, but um, essentially if you, you could easily jump off Bennu. Um, the escape velocity is very, very low, so you'd weigh um, almost nothing. It's a very, very low gravity asteroid. Da -da -da -da, scrolling up. It's very slimming. <laughs> yes. Um, there's a question from Stephen there about any concerns about bringing anything evil back, virus or bacteria. Um, no, of course we um, go through intensive um, procedures to make sure to quarantine everything and to study it in detail. Um, we are more concerned, of course, with us contaminating it than it contaminating us because we don't want um, when the sample lands um, there in Utah, again, it's going to parachute down, but it still has a nice jostle when it lands. Um, we are more concerned about 
the outside environment here on Earth contaminating the sample. Um, but no, the chances of anything, um, this the material has been baking on the surface of this asteroid, um, again, going through this three, free saw, saw cycle and being exposed to the um, unfiltered light of the sun for billions and billions of years. Um, so no, the risk of there being any sort of um, contamination of Earth from the sample is extremely low to being uh, non-existent. Um, the bigger issue for us is us contaminating the sample because we want as pristine of a sample as possible so we can um, really determine what the, um, the asteroid is like, get the most accurate data possible. What is my most satisfying moment working on the OSIRIS-REx project? Um, I would say del uh, delivering my last commands. So as I mentioned, um, those um, images from the Osprey um, site um, from our recon. So we had, um, during the recon phase, we did our low flyovers of the, um, the target sites. And I did um, develop the commands for the, um, my last commands I developed actually were for that low flyover of the um, backup site, the Osprey site. And uh, I'd say um, actually like hitting that, that button to submit the commands and this for the last time, that was just really, really, uh, that moment hit home for me about uh, how long a journey it had been. It, three years doesn't sound like a lot of time, but when you're working nonstop for three years, um, developing these commands, getting those uh, images back, it's a really, really uh, special experience. We had another question. Um, have there been other comparable missions to orbit asteroids or other missions in general that you were, that you were able to take inspiration of when planning this mission? Yep, so we um, take on, uh, we learn lessons from everyone. Um, so as mentioned, we also, um, we are worked very closely with the Hayabusa 2 team, also the Hayabusa 1 team, but then all the asteroid missions, there's a long history of them from uh, rec all the history of missions to um, Ceres, to um, Vesta, and all the other um, asteroids that have been visited by um, spacecraft in the past. But um, for this one, this is a very, very um, unique mission. Um, when you're orbiting a much bigger asteroid, something like Ceres, your team tends to follow a flow that's much more like operating around an astro a planet like Mars. So if you um, are operating something like the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter um, and you send up command to take an image and the command doesn't go quite right, well, your spacecraft's not gonna suddenly drift into Mars. You're in a stable orbit around a large planetary body. Um, but this is again, the smallest um, planetary body that we have ever orbited before. And so um, there's a lot more uncertainty in that. And so we need to make um, sure, and that's why we had this eight week cycle for um, building, developing and testing our commands. Cause we really needed to make sure nothing would go wrong with our commanding before we sent it to the asteroid. Cause if we, um, put the safe, safe craft into what's called safe mode. So all um, spacecraft are designed with something called safe mode, where if something is off nominal, the spacecraft um, says, hey, look, something is weird. I don't know what it is. I'm going to stop what I was doing and put myself in as safe a uh, configuration as possible. And so in our case, that involves blasting away from the asteroid because you don't know if that thing that happened that went wrong is something that may, might make you um, hit the asteroid or lose communication on um, what if you pass into the um, dark, uh, into the eclipse on the other side of the asteroid and you have some sort of power issue. And so our safe mode um, when we were in pro close proximity to the asteroid was to actually back away from the asteroid, which would actually have a huge impact then on our schedule because we would need to stop, assess what was going on and um, then reapproach the asteroid. So it could be several month delay if we had to have a safe mode on. So that's, yeah, it's exception, exceptionally nominal. Um, so that's actually, um, it's funny Dan mentions that in the chat um, because, you know, we're getting back again to a little bit team superstitions and things like that. But uh, whenever you're in those big meetings, anytime someone might get close to saying everything went normally or everything went great, everyone in the room just like, oh, why did you say that? Uh, and so the habit we kind of got into with the team is saying uh, exceptionally nominal. Everything went exceptionally nominal, or um, the maneuver went nominally. Uh, so yeah, no one wants to jinx the, uh, the maneuver or the operation. <laughs> uh, Max Irwin asks, what are those things that look like camping ovens next to the telescope call? Well, those are grills. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, 
if anyone ever takes your telescope out to the Tucson area and wants a good dark sky site, I would highly recommend um, Karchner Caverns State Park. Um, it's southeast of Tucson a ways, maybe about an hour, hour and a half drive, depending on how you drive and where you're driving from. But um, they have a large open campsite area there. And um, so I am using one of the um, grills in their campsite as a stand for my laptop for my acquisition. But one of the things I also like there is it's an improved campsite. So they have power plugs all over the place. So I don't need to worry about having a big Celestron power tank out with me to power my telescope and to power the laptop. Because um, as you can see, it's a quite a beefy gaming laptop that I drag out there with me. Uh, yeah, so I really like having an improved campsite to do my imaging. So Karchner Cavern State Park, I highly recommend it. Well, we're coming up on uh, eight, uh, 10 o'clock uh, oh, Eastern wow. time. Um, <laughs> so that's okay. Um, is there any other questions there? I think uh, we maybe stick a fork in it. Right. All right. Hey, thanks again, everyone. And uh, I didn't bring it out earlier, but uh, yeah, Waz has always stayed uh, near and uh, true to my heart. I still have my uh, Waz shirt. For, um, and nice. I usually actually wear, wear the shirt every time I take that telescope out. And uh, Cal reminded me the other day of my Waz uh, TNG hat, but I still to this day have my Waz TNG baseball There hat. she blows. That's nice. Yep. Managed to dig it out from my uh, storage unit. So I absolutely love Waz, and I, um, I can't thank Waz enough. Um, definitely Waz got me through some very difficult times as a kid and um, definitely inspired me to um, keep the course and to really stay with um, space throughout my entire life. And it has been a lifelong passion, but Waz definitely was a very nurturing environment for me as a kid. And um, I can't thank you guys enough for those of you who were there when I was a kid um, at Waz and um, for keeping the club strong. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Josh. All right, thank you. Well, there we go. Um, so I have no idea who's next month. It'll be a surprise to all of us. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be great, though. I promise you that. Puppet show, right? Sock puppets, <laughs> right? So, thank you, everybody. And uh, I've got uh, remainders of a thunderstorm here, so I'm gonna run, and uh, we'll see you all very soon. And I guess we may have an announcement for members uh, sometime uh, later this week. All right. Thanks, everybody. Ciao. Good night.